This is the Sony KD-32DX40AS. It is a 32 inch pure flat widescreen CRTV. It's from around the year 2002 as the service manual is dated. This is the remote. This is the matching remote or as Sony calls them the remote commander model RM-933 two double A's in the back. Uh, on the front here we have the main power button and the indicator light on the right for standby and power on and the infrared remote sensor on the left. There are no connections directly on the front. The TV does not hold the Wega badging. There are some connections on the side here, little panel that pops out. And we have a composite input with stereo audio input and headphones and an S-video and some controls there with channel up and down, volume up and down, AV back to regular TV. The reason for this coming into the collection is because it's got a couple of SCARTs in the back. It's yet another Sony of that era from around the early 2000s that has SCART in the back. There were a number of TVs like this. This is probably the third one, the third type model that I've had in the collection with the SCART, so I'll explore that a bit more later. Some other badging on there, integrated digital TV. So it does have a tuner to pick up digital TV. I think that would be obsolete now as it would be standard definition only, not HD digital tuning. We will have a look around the back. Now you can see the back and its stylings. There's its badge or model number I should say. It is a proper Australian model, AS. The AS designates from Australia. Manufactured in Japan too. There's a cable relief, strain relief. And there there's a UK power plug socket. And then there's a couple of hooks to wrap around the power cable. And as we go along we get into the more important things. In particular the SCART, so they're native SCART sockets, they're not added to by an end user. I'm going to talk about what this thing can do a little further into the video, it's actually quite interesting. You can see already there's three dots there in the, in the screen or the representation of the screen, three dots for red, green, blue, so whether that's RGB, whether that's component, I will reveal that mystery shortly. There's your audio in. Got quite a number of antenna sockets here. Another interesting little connector, a mini DIN there, labeled for modem. Don't know if the modem ever came out. And also here there's an expansion slot. There's a little diagram for what appears to be a card. This turns out to be a PCMCIA expansion card slot area. I doubt there's anything in there to slide a card in, but we will have a look at that. PCM CIA was uh, a standard, it might be still used, but it's used for laptop. It's a basically a compact form of PCI Express. It's like a credit card, so you could stick the credit card device in, and on the end of it, it might have had some USB slots or an SD card slot or whatever it was designed to do. It's quite versatile. So now it's time to take the back cover off and have a look inside at the chassis in the tube. Now, I made a mistake. The TV is actually made in UK. The mention of Tokyo, Japan on the back was just to signify the headquarters of Sony rather than where it's made. I also see that the tube's made in the UK, labels upside down, but you can see made in UK. A widescreen for W, 76 centimeters for the size, or 32 inch in a widescreen configuration. The yoke over there, made in Malaysia. The chassis is not super big, although this area over here is a little bit more interesting. There actually is the PCMCIA card slot. It's there ready to go. You can insert a card in there. There's what appears to be a, an eject or insertion mechanism there. I'd say this side of the chassis, this board area, takes care of the digital tuning, or both tuning, but the digital as well. There's not actually a lot of chips on this board set, like not big, big chips, which is a good sign that it's probably a fairly simple TV in a sense, or it's one that perhaps doesn't have the 100 hertz processing. I haven't confirmed yet whether or not that's the case, so we'll need to turn it on shortly and see how it goes. 
This is the method to get into the service menu, but firstly, make sure that the remote is in TV mode. There's a button here, and it can configure to three spots. You can see that the TV below the TV, there is a little green light. Push it again, you can go to VCR, push it again, you go back to TV and then to DVD. So you can toggle through like that. Just make sure you're on TV, because if it's not on TV, you won't get full functionality of the remote and you will not be able to enter the service menu. So there's four key presses necessary to press in order to get into the service menu. And the first one is the is the info button. So press the info button, then five, then plus, and then this last button, this digital one here. Those keys are sequential, they're not all at the same time, so just press them once let go and then go into the next one. So you do this when the television's on standby. So the TV's plugged into a power point, the switch is turned on at the power point, but the TV is not on itself. You will see the little red light indicator indicating that it's on standby. That's when you enter this code. And once you've done that, the TV will switch on and be in service mode, which I will show later in the video. I've got the NES connected to the TV via composite video. It's a PAL NES. Obviously the game's Duck Hunt. This is going to test the TV to see if it's a 100Hz model or not. I've got a gun here, the NES Zapper. A little bit more volume. I'll even put the TV into a, a widescreen mode. Yeah, it still works, no problems. I'm happy to say that light gun games work, and I think we have confirmation that the set is not 100 hertz, so that's a big tick in its favour. The TV has this strange picture in front of us. This is actually one of the wallpapers that it has built in. We're on the digital TV part of the system. Now I've got a PlayStation 1 PAL hooked up via SCART cable, I'll turn it on. It automatically changes to AV1. You can see that there's dot crawl occurring around the diamond there, so it's in composite video, not RGB. I'll reset it again, and then I'll change channel, I'll push AV button to change it. Now it is in a mode of RGB of sorts, you saw the three green dots in the square then but the picture is not working I'll just reset it again so to me the symptoms look as if this TV is expecting component video right now that pinkish tinge is usually a sign of that and bad sync the manual does state that it takes RGB and that you can use the RGB via a PlayStation. Doesn't say PlayStation 2, it just says PlayStation RGB. So that gave me hope that it would display RGB. So what we'll do is we'll plug in a PlayStation 2 with a component lead in that socket and see what, see what happens. If you're wondering how I'm going to put component video through into the SCART socket, I've got an adapter here that takes the red, the green and the blue into the SCART. And then that'll go into the back of the TV, obviously. We'll try that now. Now the PlayStation 2 is connected to the TV and we're getting similar symptoms before as the PlayStation 1 did. But when we change the component, the truth will be revealed. Go to component. Wham! It works. So the SCART socket definitely accepts component video through it. Now I'm going to test a game from the PS2 on the TV, the Wonder Boy Collection, test out 240p, 480i and those other signals and see how compatible it is, see if it continues to work. Wonder Boy is running in 480i, again on the PS2 over component, in a 4.3 aspect ratio, we will change it to 240p, 240p, yes, yes. Okay, so we seem to be successfully running in 240p over the component lines. We'll give that a tick. 
Now, I doubt very much that it'll display in 480p. There we are, 480p. Let's give it a go. Nope. No surprise. A television that only supports a 50 and 60 hertz refresh rate does not usually or ever support 480p and above. So that's a no, that's not a surprise. One more detail to add here. If I go into the menu of the television and go down to the setup here, go into detail setup, there is a option here, YUV centering, to shift the picture right and left. As such, it's interesting to note that it calls it YUV, which corresponds to the fact that we are running component right now. I stated before the manual indicates RGB, but I have also seen in the service manual referring to YUV instead. That mystery will clear up a little more later, but for now, we see that it only works with the component. Not sure what this output, AV2 output is. Output? That might be that you can daisy chain RGB out of the TV and into another RGB source, but I won't try and test that right now. I'm in the service menu now. Hopefully the screen's not flickering as badly as it is on the camera's screen right now. So this is the introductory screen for the service menu. You can press menu and we get a fairly English non-cryptic service menu to work on. Geometry, a lot of changes you can make there. I like this error menu. It actually seems to have reported quite a number of errors there in the column with the zeros. That can be cleared as well. Now, whether this has had faults that have now been cured, repaired, or whether it contains faults still to this day, I do not know. But the TV does seem to work properly. It's also got an hour counter there. It's done 8,388 hours. Nice to know. Uh, design. Now, it gets a bit more cryptic here. And this is where the interesting thing starts to happen. So here in this menu, design, there's, there's something there for RGB. Of course, anything with RGB I'm going to try and activate. I just push right and the picture disappears. If I push left, it comes back to normal. So I think the column of digits on the right is in binary and the RGB has two states on and off. Now it gets really interesting here with YUV. Got the PlayStation 1 hooked in again via SCART RGB. Let's turn the volume down a bit. Hang up. Just trying to get back to it taking RGB. Yeah, there. So TV only accepts component video, right? We've established that. If we go into design, and to the YUV, and we change that, it accepts it. It accepts it. Watch, I'll reset. That is now in RGB. The TV now accepts RGB. It's switched over to accepting it via the service menu. However, I've tried to save it and it does not save. As soon as you exit, as soon as you turn the TV off, it's back to component only. The saving of the TV works. If you change geometry settings, turn the TV off, turn it back on, your geometry settings are saved. So the TV will save settings, but it will not save into RGB. So I was with the dilemma of how how can we get it to be RGB normally? How can we what can we do? And I sort of stumbled across 
another thing I really stumbled here again on the main menu now that TT with the dash dash you can enter digits now to activate up other functions in the service menu so you can see it's on Oz and I assume that's for Australian settings now I can push 21 and it changes 22 I get BL I don't know what BL stands for maybe it's Belgium right but anyway what I found is if you leave it on Belgium it'll actually be in RGB mode now so much so I'll turn the television off get out of the service menu turn it back on go across there TV's off, TV's back on. PlayStation's still running in RGB. And the interesting thing is, when you go down here to detail setup again, it doesn't call it YUV anymore, it's RGB. So changing that setting at the start from AUS to BL or whatever it was, BS Belgium, switches it into RGB mode. So I don't know how to get things to run component and RGB without changing any of these things but at least we now know that the TV will uh, run RGB and component if you want it it's 50 and 60 Hertz there's no 100 Hertz processing the picture quality is good it's probably the first television I've seen that you can actually get RGB going in the service menu so overall I like the unit I was going to part with it but I'm tempted to almost keep it now but I'll be interested to hear what you guys out there say. The chassis is the FE2, and that's used in a number of Sony's televisions. There's still more on the market that I haven't acquired, as I mentioned earlier in the video. More SCART-based Sony televisions from the early 2000s. But this one's one of the few ones that is only 50 hertz. Sorry to stop hammering on about it, but I was a little bit impressed and a little bit excited by the whole thing. So, not a bad unit. The picture quality is actually probably oh, it's pretty good I kind of still prefer the older black Sony's with the SCART and the European models but this isn't too bad so it's certainly got possibility I'd love to hear your opinions on it anyhow more videos coming please stay tuned see you later